and off we go on another mini adventure. We're going to start with an oil change today because we're going 850 miles in probably 24 hours. So it's going to be a busy one. <laughs> Yes, we are heading up north to go and pick up something up off eBay, straight up the A1, all the way up to Lancashire to Clitheroe. So what's the plan? Why am I going all the way over to Clitheroe? I'm about 110 miles off, I've done about 250, and the car's still going, touch, touch wood. Anyway, let's have a chat about why we're going there. Well, I'm picking up another DIY magazine synthesizer from the 1970s. I've mentioned it in a few of the videos. I did. I mentioned it in the DigiSound 80 video, the Formant video. It is the Practical Electronics PE Sound Synthesizer. I found a decent example on it on eBay. It's a pickup only, hence why I'm going all the way. But uh, we'll have a look in more detail. But yeah, this is the sound synthesizer. And I think from the pictures, it's a good example. But it's going to be fresh from February 1973, adding a bit of damage and dust and yeah anyway we've got to get going because i'm already an hour late so it says on the sat nav we've got another 110 miles and it's going to take two hours and 20 minutes driving for seven hours. I'm half an hour off. It's been about 350 miles. Oh, oh my bum is so numb. The car touched wood so far hasn't skipped a beat. Anyway, I'm half an hour off. I'll let you know how it goes. Uh, yeah, I'll see you in a bit. Could it be that Clitheroe is just around this roundabout? I think it might be. Look, Clitheroe. Oh yeah, we're, we're nearly at Clitheroe. <laughs> I've made it, and well, I am with Stephen Westell. And we're in his workshop. Uh, you made this, didn't you? This yes, is the PE yes. practical When I was a young man of 20 years old. 20 years old. So, so what year would that be? 71 to 73, somewhere in the yes. 70s, early 70s anyway, you know. I watched the clockwork or orange. Um, there's music by Walter Carlos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I bought this, which is included, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Look at the old oscilloscope uh -huh, and the blah, 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 the, the old timers, etc. Um, I bought that and I got hooked. I thought, yeah, I'm going to make one. I can't play a, a, a note in music. I can't play a note. But anyway, I do block diagrams and it's all based on 741 operational amplifiers. You'll know what they are, I won't obviously. So it's all analogue. There's no, no mm -hmm. digital chips in there. Underneath this homemade wooden bit, mm -hmm. it's a proper Vero or Vero case. This is all my own work from when I was a young silly lad. The guy that um, used it on stage, a friend of mine, he's also Steve. He he must have drilled holes and done something. I don't know what he did. I haven't powered it up. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reason why it shouldn't do things. Should we try and power it up sure now for to... shits and giggles? Just see if it does something. Yeah. Some lights come on. Well, the PSU is in here, obviously. Envelope generator. It's a hell of a long time ago since I built this. Did you make the chassis yourself? Then these are all. I made the yeah. I did these, um, but the actual frame. Um, I bought that. Cost me a fortune. Thank you. I didn't really have the money to pay for it, but I did. But anyway, every month it started in let's just say January for for example. I couldn't wait for February. I couldn't wait for March, April, May, June. And every time I got the magazine yeah. from the local news agents, I proceeded to build it, you know, and uh, oh, it was oh, fantastic. You know, we've got something through a letterbox. I can do the uh, voltage controlled amplifier or whatever. Yeah, know. yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was great. There was no PCBs, it was all straight board stuff. That's all amazing. Board. Um, I think I tag you up reasonably well. You have? To this, that'd be a thing, no? So you mentioned your friend, uh, Steve Lowton, yeah. played this on stage. He did indeed. When yeah. was this around? Uh, the 70s. But what the two aluminium knobs, I don't know what they are. We have the keyboard in the back, managed to wrestle it behind this silly thing. Here we go, where are we gonna pop this? It might, it might fit down here. Right, I'm gonna try and get this, plop these down in this 
footwell. Yes, I made it, and as you can see, it is all in the back. Stephen was a lovely fella, and it was awesome to actually meet the maker. Sometimes the owners that you get these DIY synthesizers from aren't actually the makers. But yeah, Stephen, exactly when the Practical Electronics um, subscription was coming out, was building this month by month. He mentioned that he was so into it that he went to London, I think with his mum, uh, to uh, watch a presentation by the designer of this about the Practical Electronics PE synthesizer. So this is a really good example of it and we're gonna drive home now. Right then, we, we best get home then. Oh, off we go, off we go, off we go. That was a lovely experience, I've got to be honest. That was really, a really good time and a really good day. It's not over yet. We're gonna get ourselves home. Okay, so as you can see, it is a daylight again. Basically, when I started driving back last night, the A1, the whole of the A1, which if you're not knowing, is the backbone of the east of England. And there was countless diversions that took you down single roads and stuff. It was pretty fun, but it added an extra three hours onto the drive. I ended up giving up around Peterborough. I'm currently next to Sawtree again. And uh, yeah, we're gonna carry on on our way and try and get home because yeah, it's a long one. I just stopped for some lunch and I've got some uh, got some friends with me. Oh man, that's a mess. One thing's for sure, the uh, the sheep certainly like it. <laughs> So now we got it home, we can take a closer look. So I took the top off to see what was going on with the Vero case and things like that. And then also remove all of the bits and bobs and just, you know, have a good old look around and see what was going on. Uh, they all came out quite nicely and they looked like they were in very good condition, actually. This is the power supply. I started by taking the capacitors off and checking them. They seemed all right for now. So I just kept them as they were, checked the voltages. And then we went on to the first module, which is the voltage control oscillator we cleaned the potentiometers well tried to clean them anyway and we put them in to see if it did anything oh something okay it's starting to make sense we've got the triangle wave and we've got the square wave Obviously, it's not doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Number two's not functioning, but number one. So there is two oscillators, one and two. This is the frequency, the volume of the triangle wave, the volume of the square wave for both. And these are the outputs. Not sure what the mini jack is. It might be an input, still figuring it out. This is the cutout folder that Stephen included with it. Unfortunately, the full schematic isn't here and it's not clear what exactly the variable resistors do here, which we need to adjust to make it sort of work. So let's go and try and find the April 1973 issue of Practical Electronics. It's gotta be in here somewhere. March 1965, that's a little bit early, but pretty funky. April 1973, that's what we need. So I sat down and gave it a good read, had a look at the schematic to see what was going on with the oscillators. And it turns out that the back board was the buffers for the input and the power supply and then these two boards on the front they were both exactly the same for both oscillators let's first take it apart the first thing we're going to do is temporarily solder these three wires that's coming from an external power supply so we don't have to constantly put in and out of the circuit the plus 15 volts the ground and the minus 15 volts are up on the top right here okay so the positive rail doesn't seem to be doing what it's supposed to be doing it's only giving out eight volts so that means there's something wrong and it might mean that these capacitors which don't actually look very happy might be a little bit um, iffy so as we saw in the magazine it's split into two sections we know that one of the oscillators works and one of them doesn't as far as i'm aware this is the first oscillator that might work and this one's the second oscillator which might not work. The resistor that's right here is going from the positive rail, it's going down here. This is going in to power the second oscillator. 
it looks like this one is the filtering cap on the second oscillator that might just be being a little bit iffy. What we're gonna do is we're gonna isolate this resistor first by snipping its leg a little bit. We can stick it back together a little later on and see if this actually gives a reading of 15 volts again instead of eight volts that it's doing right now. Okay, so that's lifted up, it's 15. So the problem is on this side. The next thing I'm gonna do is snip the leg of this capacitor, which I reckon is the uh, culprit. Lift it up, hey, 15, we're on 15 again. So the culprit is this. Doesn't help that the replacement ones are slightly larger. Since that one's gone, let's go to whole hog and replace the rest of them as well. Oh yeah, look at that. Right, with any luck when we turn it back on, it doesn't blow up. Oh, that's good. Let's measure, so this should be minus 15-ish. Near enough, plus 15-ish. Boom! It was good to change those capacitors because that problem would have affected the rest of the modules. Anyway, I still wasn't able to get the other oscillator working, but let's give that a break and have a look at the magazine synthesizer series as a whole. This journey starts in February 1973 as it is on the front cover of Practical Electronics. This is the introduction to get you all revved up and ready to go with the idea of building your own synthesizer. Oh, and there's a biological amplifier. I reckon that could become an instrument at some point anyway. In this issue of the magazine, there is no building. It just lets you outline that you might want to build this synthesizer when it comes in the next month. And there is also pictures of Jeff's prototype designs and also an outline of what's going on. But we're going to jump over to March where we start looking at the actual case and the power supply. The case is made by Vero and you could have ordered it by post and then put it together with the instructions in the magazine. This is what it would have looked like at the time and there's also McMurdo connectors on the back and there's a schematic of the power supply which is made to sit in the back of the module right here. As you can see there's some big caps and a transformer. In April it really starts beginning when you build your first module. This is a dual voltage controlled oscillator. It's the thing that makes the buzz do 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 and in this is a description saying due to simplicity they are linear oscillators but there is space in the strip board to actually modify them to make them more musically useful and we'll be looking at that later in the video. Oh look how lovely that is. Anyway we jump over to May 1973. This is when we build our second module. It is called the ramp generators and these are low frequency oscillators. They're the things that modulate the bits and bobs that go on in the synthesizer including making the oscillator go woo. There's also a synthesizer programming sheet. Anyway, we've built that, let's pop that in. Looking lovely, and now we can jump over to June where we get a little bit experimental with the sample and hold a noise generator. This thing will give this the ability to make pseudo random sequences and reasonably musical finger majiggies. There's the schematic right there for the noise and the sample and hold. Steven would have followed this image to put it together and plop it in to make it look just like that. Very nice. But hold your horses, it's July now, and it's time to make the tone control. This is less of a filter and more of an EQ style thing that you would have seen in a mixing desk. And it's not like many other filters in other synthesizers. And there is also information on how to wire this up and record it if you really want using tape machines. Ooh. Now it's time to add a little bit of room around the synth by adding the reverberation module, which also has a ring modulator built into it. This is the output of the synthesizer. And as you can see, it's quite a complex build. This and the VCO are definitely the most complicated ones to pop together. In September 1973, Stephen would have been putting together the envelope shaper module. This is the attack, decay, and sustain module. It works in a different way to other ones, and you can also make an audio logic probe for all your audio logic probing needs. Oh, look at that, it's nearly done. All lovely jubbly. In October, Stephen would have been introduced to the dual voltage controlled amplifier module that he would have had to put together with the instructions that are in front of us right now. By this module, you would have been well versed in putting these things together. And as you can see, it's looking lovely. There is also the rear wiring for all of the internal connections in the synthesizer at the bottom of that page there. Anyway, let's plonk it in. As you can see, that's all of the modules in the box. Look at that. There, oh, it's lovely, lovely. Lovely, lovely, jubbly, lovely, jubbly. Ooh, very nice. But this project didn't actually stop there. There is a keyboard controller module that also has oscillators inside of it 
that are a much more musical type of oscillator than the one in the modular. This is the thing that's going to really make it musical because without this, it's a bit of a weird sound generator that makes spacey sounds. But we'll be having a look at the keyboard later. Oh, oh dear. And I came to the conclusion I needed to read about it more and we'll be covering that in another video. What is this? Oh my giddy aunt. Is that fit there? Does that go on there? That's, oh no. There's random circuit boards that have no explanation. Uh, let's just put the top on this and pretend it doesn't exist for now. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So let's get back to the modular box. I had a check at the rest of the modules and they still all seemed to check out all right. All of the wires were connected. It all seemed happy days. I got some contact cleaner and had a good go at trying to clean the potentiometers because I knew that that was an issue in the oscillator. So it was likely to be in this as well. I started plugging them back in slowly but surely and it started to make some sounds. Well, it started to make some funky sounds anyway. <laughs> As you can hear, those potentiometers, I did spend an ages on cleaning them, but they were so crackly. Just gonna just gonna take the back off one of them. They're completely tarnished. They're they're really green. No contact cleaner or WD-40 was gonna sort that out, so I decided to swap one of the potentiometers with a very similar era potentiometer to see if it made a difference. Oh wow. It was magical, the difference was humongous, so I actually ended up changing nearly 50% of the potentiometers. It took a day, but it was definitely worth it. Oh yes, this is definitely the way to go. There was a random hole on the front of the envelope generator and also reading that paragraph said that there was meant to be a button and there was two bare wires on the back. So obviously we're going to plop in a button and see what happens. Well, that worked out, didn't it? Anyway, it's time to have a look again at the oscillator, the second oscillator that wasn't working and really try and kind of fix it. The first thing I did was replace all the potentiometers again, uh, just to make sure that it definitely wasn't the potentiometers causing the problem. Then after a bit more fiddling around, I found it was this capacitor in the integrator part of the oscillator that wasn't working. So I got these capacitors and swapped it out and now, Now that works, we can test the synthesizer's true space noise making capabilities. confirmed that this machine can make some pretty mad space sounds. However, in order to plug it into different synthesizers and sequences, funnily enough, it's not as straightforward as you might think. It turns out the standards at which it works is from an opposite reality, where everything is a negative voltage. For instance, to trigger the envelope generator to make it go, ooh, you don't need a positive voltage, you don't need to send it to ground like a Moog synthesizer, no, you have to send a minus voltage. And that's the same with the oscillator. In order to 
to control it, unlike other synthesizers where they're linear, like the MS-10 and such like that, or logarithmic, like Eurorack or Moog synthesizers, this one works in what I would only describe as a negative linear fashion. That means instead of the usual sending some voltage and the higher the voltage goes, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 volts, and the pitch goes higher, no, you have to send in minus 1, minus 2 volts, and the pitch will go higher. So it's it's literally backwards. So I cobbled together a quick piece of strip board to bung in the back, which basically inverts the voltages that you send in. So if you send a 1 volt into the synthesizer, it will send out a minus 1 volt. This means you can send in a normal trigger from another sequencer or synthesizer, like 5 volts, and it will send out a minus 5 volts to the synthesizer to actually make it work. It was a really quick slapdash design and I've put a schematic on top of it, so when it's bunged in the back and somebody looks at it and goes, what the heck is that? At least they can sort of see my thinking. The oscillators inside of it, I struggled to get tracking more than an octave or so, but it was enough to make it somewhat musical and play with other things. Another thing to bear in mind is this was 1973, the DIY synthesizers of this ilk were in their relative infancy. There were a few other projects around like Tim Orr's one in the Practical Wireless magazine, but it seems as a PE synthesizer project was being rolled out, builders and readers of Practical Electronics were sending in their thoughts via post, which meant that Jeff Shaw, the designer, updated the project as it went along. For instance, if we read this paragraph from the November 1973 issue about the introduction of the keyboard, when the sound synthesizer was originally presented for publication, it was the intention that it should be classed as a general purpose instrument, which could be exploited in the widest possible number of ways, and yet retain a basic simplicity of design and ease of construction. During the course of the series, however, many readers have commented that the musical capabilities of the instrument have been severely restricted by the lack of logarithmic VCOs. Woo. And thus the oscillator to be described in this article has has been included in the keyboard unit in the hope that it will put matters right. So yes, this paragraph backs up our findings that the box is not going to be the most musical thing in the world. We've got to get on to the keyboard, which we will be doing in another video. As it seems that within the keyboard, there are built-in oscillators that do a better job at being musical. And if you look at the controls on the image on the front of the magazine, you'll see that it's a heck of a lot busier than the initial image in February 1973. I've had this synthesizer for about five or six days, so I haven't been able to fully delve into the keyboard part of this. Anyway, I've set the synthesizer up today in This Museum's Not Obsolete so people can play on it, have a go, and see what they think for themselves. I feel the machine that Stephen built is truly a time capsule of the machine, and it accurately represents what Jeff the designer was going for. I'm really pleased to add it to the collection of DIY synthesizers over at This Museum Is Not Obsolete. This video has been a very enjoyable journey to make from the start and there's gradual more in-depth videos about my findings of the synthesizer and slight modifications that I've done as well as samples and sounds that you can download of the synthesizer over on my Patreon which needless to say supports making the videos and the museum that is going in. Anyway thanks a lot for watching don't forget to subscribe I'm Look Mum No Computer that was the Practical Electronics PE synthesizer and remember don't be scared to try it. Well, maybe, maybe don't try and fix this one. Ooh.